Okay, it's going to be a review of Lockdown 2008. This has the blow-off to the highly controversial Kurt Angle versus Samoa Joe feud inside of a steel cage to six sides of steel. Um, I, I thought this would be a really cool video to review, so I decided to go with Lockdown 2008. I, I know most people wanted 2010. Uh, I'll, I'll talk about that at the end of the video. But, yeah, you know, at the time, uh, th this... This got a, lot, a very mixed reaction. I, I just remember at the time, you know, a, a guy like True Slayer was not a big fan of this show. When Robbie Feinstein did the uh, interview with Kurt, you know, he mentioned that it was very highly received. People loved the match and it, it got, you know, tremendous, uh, tremendously high ratings, star ratings. Um, so it, it is a polarizing match the, the, you know, the MMA style worked shoot, uh, didn't quite resonate with everybody, but I, I'm kind of in the, in the middle on it. I, I don't think it's an amazing main event. I don't think it's Angle and Joe's best match, but at the same time, I, I did think it was a refreshing, uh, you know, style of a match, but, uh, but yeah, let's get right into it. So this took place, uh, 15 years ago, April 13th, uh, 2008. So we're a little bit late on this, but it's cool. Uh, this was from Lowell, Massachusetts, you know, right outside the Boston area. Obviously, you can see the Celtic uh, Shamrock uh, on the cover. Uh, the venue is actually, I guess, the, I, I'm assuming the T is silent, but I guess it's the Songus uh, Arena. This is the same venue that they just had uh, Death Before Dishonor uh, last summer when the Briscoes and FTR had their uh, two out of three fall classic. Uh, for those that don't remember, uh, the attendance is 5,500 uh, at the time. Uh, I believe this is the highest paying uh, audience in TNA history. Not the most attended. Uh, I think that would actually be Lockdown 2007. But yeah, it kind of got me thinking. Lockdown was pretty a pretty successful event. I would have said that this was the third uh, biggest you know, TNA event. But when you add up the, the buy rates and, and when you look at these attendance figures, um, you can make the argument that is number one. Um, so so I, I did this just for curiosity. I, I wanted to see from 2005 to 2009, what was the highest buy rates um, between Bound for Glory and Lockdown? Believe it or not, uh, Bound for Glory came in at 203,000 combined for 05 to 09. And then Lockdown surprisingly 205,000 uh from 2005 to 2009 those, those are the main years about tna that i really care about before hogan and bischoff came in so yeah it, it really did surprise me you know slammiversary is definitely i would say the third wheel you know maybe even the fourth wheel i mean uh you know, you, you want to say it's their SummerSlam. Maybe it's because it's in June. You know, the, those shows didn't do well for whatever the reason. And I'm, I'm kind of torn out what's the big four out of TNA pay-per-views. I, I really don't think it's Victory Road. I can understand why some people would say Victory Road because it was the first pay-per-view. But there were a lot of years where Victory Road did awful buy rates and were, were poorly promoted. So uh, Genesis and Final Resolution, those swapped. So I wouldn't say TNA had a big four. I would say it was more of a big three. Um, so yeah, this did this did 55,000 pay-per-view buys, which would put it ac exactly third um, as the, you know TNA's third biggest buy rate of all time. Obviously, number one was uh, Genesis 2006 featuring Angle and Joe 1. Um, you know, number two would be Bound for Glory 2006 featuring Jeff Jarrett and Sting with Kurt Angle as the enforcer. So, you know, give Angle and Joe credit. You know, their matches drew money, you know, for TNA standards, I would say. And, you know, give Kurt Angle credit as well. I mean, obviously, Jarrett's going to want to plug himself as number two. He corrected Conrad, actually, and said, I, I thought number two was uh, Sting versus Jeff. Uh, but you got to keep in mind, Kurt Angle was the special enforcer. That was Kurt Angle's, you know, pay-per-view debut since the announcement so uh give kurt a lot of credit i, I don't think he gets a, a lot of people have this perception that kurt was a terrible draw you know maybe compared to austin but you know I, I still think kurt is a pretty big draw compared to someone um that's uh you know a generic you know superstar so to say so let's get right down to it uh first match of the night we got the escape match uh for the x division championship we got jay lethal consequent consequences creed who's actually Xavier Woods, uh, for those of you that are too young to remember this show. Uh, and I would agree with True Slayer. I, I love that when Consequences Creed had the Apollo Creed trunks 
And by the way, man, uh, the, the, the problem with these Creed movies is that you're always going to think about how can we get Carl Weathers into the script, and you just can't do it. But hey, man, you got Consequences Creed. You got Christopher Daniels playing the Curry Man. You got Johnny Devine. You got Sharp Boy and Sanjay Dutt. So, so not, not a great mix of talent here. I just felt like there was too many guys, um, you know, wearing masks, playing gimmicks. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm a huge Christopher Daniels fan. You know, is he Brian Danielson in the ring? You know, would you put him on the same level as uh, AJ and Joe? I, I'm higher on Daniels than most people. You know, for some people, like my brother, he's hit or miss, but I, I'm a huge Daniels fan. So it irked me big time that he was playing the Curry Man gimmick at this time. But hey, you know, he was he was wrestling with New Japan. You know, there there is a lot of money in, you know, wrestling a gimmick over there or, or in Mexico, wherever he was wrestling with. So I'm sure he, I'm sure he made it up and actually probably, you know, got a lot of money, you know, playing the Curry Man gimmick. So, so that's the bottom line. But overall, I, this is better than I expected. I, I thought this was a lot of fun. It, it sucked that Sanjay wasn't in the match uh, for very long, but it was a ton of fun, man. You know, Curry Man, you know, the swanton off the top of the, the cage, the crowd was hot. Uh, Lethal actually did not have the cornrows here. He was actually, uh, you know, he's bald right now, but back then, you know, he finally, this is like one of the few times I remember he just had regular hair. Uh, you know, Johnny Devine was the heel of the match. You know, the match was just a lot of fun. Uh, it was really good. It was, you know, high flying action. Uh, the ending, the ending is not great, but I get what they were going for here. So I, at this time, Sanjay and, uh, SoCal Val, and Jay Lethal, they're kind of planting the seeds for the wedding between, you know, Jay Lethal and, and SoCal Val. You know, that was like the Macho Man Miss Elizabeth thing of, of TNA. Some guys might remember. So so the ending of this thing, after uh, after Johnny Devine, I, I believe he put away the Curry Man with the J-Driller. I think he, I forget what he called it, you know, that, that Josh Alexander, you know, pile driver finisher. He had his own name for it. So he was escaping from the top of the cage. So they opened the door up so Lethal could come out. So Lethal... Lethal was probably at this show. He's probably the only one that was at this show. I don't think Daniels was back with Ring of Honor yet. So Lethal must have remembered that finish between Austin Aries and Cole Cabana from the third anniversary show. The, the, the first of the third anniversary shows. You know, if somebody re might remember, it was actually three different nights. But on, on the first night, the ending was Aries actually sacrificed his body and just you know shot himself through the door i believe it was actually through the door while it was still shut here they opened it up so lethal can just dive out and uh yeah it was cool it, it just felt a little bit abrupt it felt a little bit cheesy but yeah just kind of reminded me of how hot uh socal val was she was a redhead you know ring of honor actually had like their own version of her if anyone remembers i actually met her at uh, manhattan mayhem three but you know she she was with the company very um you know not that long so we'll move on to the next match this is the queen of the cage uh to determine the number one contender for the knockouts i wasn't a big fan of this you know a lot of these girls um you know were not great wrestlers this was this was a nice little mix of girls that just look like strippers and and porn stars as well i believe um salinas Salinas, who was with LAX when she was with WWE, I believe she actually did like some uh, hardcore like lesbian strap on stuff for real. So if, if anyone remembers that and then at the same time, Christy Hemi, you know, she, you know, a, a lot of the, you know, the, it's, it's a hot mix of women. But I, I think at this time they brought in too many women that just. You know, I, I would actually say it was below like what WWE was offering. You know, outside of Gail Kim and, and Awesome Kong, I, I was not a huge fan of this women's division. I, I just wasn't. So th this is a very wacky stipulation. I, I mean, it actually worked out well because instead of having the women in the cage, they had them outside the cage. So the first two women that get inside the cage would actually have a match. So it came down to Angelina Love uh, and Roxy uh, Laveau. Not a bad match between them. I, I thought Angelina Love... Uh, she definitely had some star qualities behind her. I, I don't think she was a great wrestler, but she had a great look, though. She she almost reminded me of, uh, you know, I would say Jenna Jameson when, um, you know, like like in the early 2000s, when around the time she she was actually a guest ring announcer for Chris Jericho, Rey Mysterio, 
it was like a video game special on Spike. Does anyone remember that? Trish was there. Little Kim was there. And Jenna was like the the guest uh, ring announcer. Like she she definitely has like that that look. So Angelina Love had a lot of star power. I thought her and Roxy had a you know really really good match right here. You know to end this thing. That was definitely the highlight of it. So you keep all the women out of the cage. But once again, I just thought it was kind of a wacky uh, stipulation. Next up, you got. And I got to go quick on this, man, because a lot of this stuff just doesn't, you know, deserve like an in-depth review. But we got uh, BG James taking on Kip James. So Billy Gunn taking on the Road Dog. This is a grudge match between the two um, New Age Outlaws, the two members of uh, Degeneration X. I just wasn't feeling it, man. I just thought it was kind of slow, generic. It wasn't bad, but, um, you know, BG gets the roll up. It looks like Kip is going to shake his hands and, you know, they're going to kind of wipe the slate clean. And then uh, Billy Gunn clocks his former best friend, clotheslines him. And that's pretty much how it ends. They want to go all heel uh, with Billy Gunn. I just don't think it was very memorable looking back on it. Uh, all right, next up we have probably the weakest stipulation of the night. This has uh, Russo written all over it, but... You know, someone someone made the argument that this might have been a Jarrett call. Uh, apparently, Memphis used to do a lot of this stuff. Uh, so you actually had to handcuff um, the tag team to the cage. You had all these handcuffs just in the cage. So that that was that was the goal here. You you had to uh, you know handcuff uh, the tag teams, and then you could obviously win by pinfall. Uh, you know, to end this thing. So I. Just, I just thought you had way too many tag teams out there. And, uh, yeah, I just, I don't know, man. Let's go through everybody here. You had Kaz and Super Eric uh, taking on Black Rain and Relic, uh, taking on LAX, the Motor City Machine Guns. Yeah, great way to utilize Alex Shelley and Chris Saban. Just have them uh, cuffed to the cage uh, for 10 minutes so they can't use their athleticism or their mind-blowing offense. You have Petey and Scott Steiner. Petey Williams and Scott Steiner. At this time, Petey Williams is like mini Scott Steiner. And I got to say, I thought Petey Williams looked like Scott Steiner's brother. Like, he, it looked like his little brother. He was in great shape. Uh, I don't know if he was clean or not, but um, it looked pretty... He looked pretty convincing as a little Papa Pump. And then you had the Rock and Rave Infection uh, with Jimmy Raven, Lance Hoyt. So yeah, not, not, not a bad mix of tag teams, but you know, it just felt like way too many. And the stipulation just, I don't know, man, I just wasn't a big fan of the stipulation. And I, I would agree, man, if it wasn't for Frankie Kazarian, this match would have sucked. He sold his ass off for a lot of these guys. Hernandez did the, um, you know, the belly, the belly, the belly by the throat to Kaz into the cage. I forget what he calls that. God, I, I had the name in my head. I'm just it's just not coming to me. Uh and then there was there was an awesome spot with Lance Lance Hoyt choke slamming Kaz uh off the top of the cage, almost off the top of the uh, off the top rope. But felt it, it felt like it was off the top of the cage, but yeah, I just wasn't a fan of it, man. It just uh it it, it the, the stipulation just really really uh put a bad taste in my mouth. And um it, it ends with Eric Young being afraid to get into the cage. And uh, he comes out as Super Eric uh, to to make the save to help Kaz. And, uh, you know, they win this thing. You know, Eric is able to cuff everybody up who he, uh, you know, after he, you know, dove off the top of the cage. And uh, Eric Young goes over. And, yeah, for, for whatever reason, this got a, a great reaction. Just uh, it just seemed like Eric Young um, got to give him credit. You know, it, it really felt like he changed his gimmick. And changed, um, you know, his demeanor year after year. So uh, it, it's the same, man, because I, I thought you had a lot of great tag teams here. It, it's just, well, you know, just like the women, I just think, you know, you, you're putting way too much talent uh, into this match. All right, next up, we got Gail Kim teaming up with ODB to take on Awesome Kong and uh, Raisha Saeed. <sighs> it was pretty good, man. So, so, you know, obviously Gail Kim and Awesome Kong uh, had some really, really good, you know, matches leading up to the show. So you you had already done that on pay-per-view. Uh, I get what they were going for here. They they didn't want to give away too much one-on-one -on -one stuff uh, to give the main event a little bit more meaning. So this just felt like a, you know, it, it is lockdown. So it didn't necessarily feel like a television match. At the same time, you were able to get ODB over. Raisha Saeed got to show what she can do. There was a couple of really, really 
you know, awesome high spots with Gail Kim hitting a, a reverse Rana from the, the top of the rope. Uh, you know, ODB got a nice splash. There were some really, really nice drop kicks uh, from Gail Kim uh, to Awesome Kong. But, you know, I, it really would have been cool to see Gail and Awesome Kong one-on-one -on -one inside the uh, the cage. Um, def definitely one of the better better matches on the show, no doubt about it. Next up, you have Booker T and Charmel uh, taking on Robert Roode and uh, Peyton Banks. I don't remember Peyton Banks at all. Yeah. And that's the thing. Like, I don't have great memories of 08. This was when I was really heavy into Ring of Honor. It was almost like after I watched the show, after the DVD came out, I will watch it once. And I would never... I, I, this is the first time I've went back to the show since the summer of 2008. So... I don't really know like 08 as well as 2002 or 2003 where, you know, WWE was my only promotion. So, you know, obviously I know that time a little bit better. I think that's one of the reasons why the Backlash 08 review didn't really, you know, was, wasn't as engaging as like a 2003 review. And the same thing would go for this show as well. Like there, you know, I, and I'd have to agree with True Slayer. This was a pretty crappy undercard. I, I just, I just feel like they really kind of watered it down to help out Joe and Angle in the main event with the overall reaction. And, and, and to a degree, it definitely worked. Uh, you know, if you want to argue that all the attention should have been put on Lethal Lockdown in the main event, I'm cool with that. And you still had got it. You still ended up with a pretty, pretty solid show. Uh, but you got Booker T teaming up with his wife, Charmel to take on Robert Roode and Peyton Banks. I wasn't a big fan of this match. I just think anytime, you know, Booker T and Charmel did anything together on television. I, I just, I never think it went over that well. Even the King Booker stuff, you know, a lot of people just found that annoying. A lot of people couldn't buy into the gimmick and, you know, Booker T putting on that King Booker act. Um, you know, this was, this was very reminiscent of Booker T and Charmel feuding with Kurt Angle. Only in here you had Robert Roode. I, I think there was a lot of positives about Booker T and Robert Roode together. Roode cut some really good promos on Booker about, you know, him coming over from WWE and you're not going to be one of these other guys that's going to be shoving me back down the, the card. So I like that stuff. I, you could definitely tell Booker T saw a lot of potential in Robert Roode and it made for good promos too. Like the, the, Robert Root had a cool sounding name, so when when Booker T started cutting a promo on him, he was like, he was like Robert Root, your sucker ass belonged to me. Like I thought it, I thought Booker sounded really really good there, and you know you could tell at this time the book the King Booker gimmick was totally out of the picture. So it, in some ways it was like a return to form for Booker T, but I don't know, man. Anytime him and Charmel were together, I just I just found it a little bit on the corny side. So. You know, I, I, I get what they were doing here. They wanted to prolong this feud. You know, I think it would have been really cool to see to see the blow off match here. Uh, but, you know, th this this ended up being uh, Charmel and Peyton Banks uh, in a roll up finish. And you got Robert Roode being disgusted with Peyton for getting pinned there. So that's pretty much how it ended. Not not a good match at all. So uh, so there we go with that. Next up, we have the lethal lockdown match. You got uh, we got Christian Cage's team, Team Cage versus Team Topko. Wow. The problem solver, Tyson Tomko, uh, has come a long way. So in some ways, this has got to be the biggest match of Tyson Tomko's uh, career. You know, I don't know what happened to Tomko. It, it seemed like after, you know, 2008, you rarely heard from him again. But you got to give Christian a lot of credit. You know, Christian is a babyface at this time. So Christian, I believe he turned babyface like the end of 2007. You know, I, I think there was a divide between AJ Tomko. Yeah, AJ and Tomko actually joined forces with Kurt Angle. And I just remember at the time, Christian was cutting some some awesome promos, like some of the best, you know, babyface promos Christian had ever cut. They were so good that they actually motivated me. I, I remember uh, how good they were. So, uh, yeah, Christian has his reputation of just being a prick and a heel, but... Uh, got to remember, Christian was was really awesome uh, during this TNA run. His popularity can't be denied. I mean, how many YouTubers do you remember that borrowed that name? Instant Classic Eight, who's actually Brandon. He was he was on the Skype video with uh, Chase and True Slayer for WrestleMania. Uh, Instant Classic G One, his name was uh, Mario. I believe he actually became a wrestler. So a lot of people. There's probably even more that 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 used that Instant Classic name. So you got Christian Cage. Uh, teaming up with Kevin Nash, Matt Morgan, uh, Rhino, and Sting. Uh, Sting comes out last. There is a lot of We Want Sting chants. Uh, so Team Tomko is actually AJ, uh, James Storm, uh, Tomko, and Team 3D. Um, okay, so I thought it was a really good lethal lockdown match. I, I thought it delivered. Um, 
I thought it did have its negatives, though. So I, I got to give Christian and AJ credit. They they were in the match the whole time. So Tomko actually comes out first, but AJ comes from behind. He gives uh, Christian the phenomenal forearm. So Christian and AJ just tear it up uh, for like for like five minutes. I got to say, Christian was the MVP here. Um, AJ was right there with them. Um, so I thought that was the biggest positive of the match. Uh, some of the negatives are, I don't know. I, I just felt like the mix of talent was a little bit past their prime. I just felt like you had guys that were really out of shape. Um, you know, I thought Nash just looked very old here. I don't mean to pull a Dylan Brooks, but you know, Nash was nowhere near, uh, LeBron James. So I, I just thought he looked lethargic and, and very old. Uh, obviously you, you kind of resurrect the Nash and Sting feud. So that was cool for some of the WCW diehard fans. But I got to say, I think Team 3D was more in their element here. This was more of, uh, you know, Brother Ray getting heat. Um, you know, Devon probably bladed you know, harder than he ever had since the old old school ECW days. So I, th this is more of like an ECW version of the Dudley. So I, I definitely like that about it. You know, you want to push some young talent like James Storm, uh, like a Matt Morgan. So, yeah, Matt Morgan had a really good show. And him and AJ had some pretty nice sequences where, you know, AJ counted a choke slam, And, you know, Matt Morgan did some really, really nice, uh, nice execution from Matt Morgan to AJ. So, Morgan definitely had his moments, you know, uh, huge dude right there. But I I'll tell you, like, the the highlight of this match is, uh, you know, just Christian and AJ and, and, and what they did with James Storm. So, you know, the, on the top of the cage, it's funny. You know, I think they went kind of cheap here. You know, the, the, the top of the cage started to give. And, uh, you know, James Storm almost went right through it. This is the first time I've seen that. You know, maybe since the Hell in a Cell with, with Taker and Foley. If, if you remember in that match, Taker with the broken foot, I believe he almost, I believe the cage started to give just from him putting his weight on the top of the cage. So the same thing pretty much happens here. This is a very cheaper cage. It's very, it's small, you know, compared to a regular steel cage in WWE, especially a Hell in a Cell. So, um, but thank God uh, he didn't pop through. Christian actually started just planting him on some of the bars that were above the cage just to make sure he was safe. Uh, but yeah, they do the TLC two spot. So AJ, I got to say, when AJ went up to the top of the cage, he got up to a, the top of the cage. He probably broke a record, you know, fastest guy to ever, you know, pull himself up to the top of the cage. So it was, it was pretty impressive. But, you know, like I was saying, the, these six sides of steels, they're, they're pretty small. Uh, but yeah, they do the TLC two bump. Um, I thought it was a little bit anticlimactic, but, you know, considering that the cage started to give, it's pretty dangerous. So, you know, you know, AJ and Christian are actually on top of a ladder. They already set up a table and it doesn't make it, you know, the, the TLC bump makes much more sense because you had three teams, you know, going at it. This is just team versus team. So obviously, you know, when, when James Storm knocks off the ladder, he's hurting AJ as well. So that's that's part of the reason why I think the bump was a little bit silly. And I don't know, like, I, I, I just don't think it had the same, you know, type of, um, it, it was a little bit anticlimactic compared to, to TLC2, you know, that type of bump. But uh, yeah, um, James Storm actually almost called him rude, but he takes the ladder um, AJ and Christian are on top of the ladder and they go through a table on the top of the cage. Uh, there's just not a lot of room up there. So maybe that's why I didn't come off great. But, uh, but yeah, that was the bump. It got a holy shit chant. It was really, really cool. Um, okay. So this match actually ends, you know, I, I remember AJ actually, you know, Sting had the finish a couple years ago in 2006 where he ended the match with the Scorpion Deathlock. AJ had that scouted, just, you know, clocked everyone with a kendo stick. So uh, Sting doesn't go over clean. It's actually uh, Rhino. Rhino actually hits uh, James Storm with a gore after Storm came down from the top and, and, you know, started taking the beer bottle and smashing it over everyone's head. But Rhino actually spears James Storm. I, I'm not crazy about the finish. It just felt to me like they didn't know who should go over here. It felt like Rhino's push really came to an end at this point. So, I don't know. I would have been... I, I think Christian really deserved, um, you know, to go over clean here with the momentum that he had. But, you know, he, he just took that nasty bump on top of the cage. So, obviously, that didn't happen. But, uh, but yeah, man, lock, lockdown was pretty good. You know, you, you got Christian, AJ, and, you know, James Storm really busting their ass here. The Dudleys, I thought, were good here. 
Uh, it, it just, you know, I, I, I thought overall, though, you just had a lot of guys that were a little bit past their prime and a little bit overweight. Um, so it's not a great mix of talent, but I'd be lying if I said this is the worst lethal lockdown. It's definitely not. It, it, this was probably one of the better ones. I will put this above 05, and uh, I, I would say it's on the same level as 06. But, uh, but yeah, it was, it, was, it was great stuff. And next up, we get to the main event. We got Kurt Angle. Taking on Samoa Joe. This is a six sides of steel for the TNA world title. Okay, so there's a lot to, to say about this match. Um, it's, it was, it's very polarizing. Um, I actually thought it was a nice change of pace. Um, I, I, I thought what they did here, you know, they, you, you, had, you had a, this whole card... You know, it, it felt a little bit watered down. You know, not a lot of stuff got a lot of time on this show. There's a lot of multi-man, a lot of tag matches. So you, you, you wanted to present the main event, you know, as one of the few, if, if not the only, you know, big time one-on-one -on -one match. So I, I think that was a good call. Uh, there were some really, really very well executed video packages here. Uh, I really felt like Joe and Angle were presented like stars. Uh, you had a lot of MMA uh stuff going on with the buildup. You know, Joe was training, you know, MMA um, in Las Vegas leading up to this thing. You had real life, um, you know, mixed martial artists training with Joe. You, you brought in Frank Trigg uh, to be an announcer here. Uh, apparently, Joe knew him uh, and, and, you know, he was a big fan of Kurt Angle. Uh, a lot of people thought he looked like Kurt Angle, but he had a lot of charisma, was a, a, somewhat of a legend in the UFC. So he was able to do commentary here. And then they got interviews from, uh, you know, actual, you know, mixed martial arts fighters uh, leading up to this thing. So I, I, everything was just very simplistic here. It, it felt like a lot of the soap opera stuff um that 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 kind of plagued the angle and joe feud uh, at hard justice was was totally out of the window the only the only thing here that was storyline driven with the soap opera stuff was actually karen angle so uh so so after you know the entrances were great you know joe comes out with his uh you know samoan entrance with the family and the over the top uh, entrance that he got at bound for glory 2005 that was great uh angle comes out with the mma uh, shorts. He's got his ankles all taped up, so he's got no boots on. I actually thought it was a re refreshing look. I thought it made the match feel different. It it's inside of a steel cage. You know, uh, UFC fights take place inside of an octagon cage, so it definitely made sense to go in this direction uh, from a lot of different levels. Um, uh, so let me talk about the Karen Angle stuff. So before the match starts, uh, Angle wants Karen Angle escorted um, you know, backstage, he, he doesn't want her a part of the match, you know, even though she did help him win, uh, you know, the last time he faced Samoa Joe at Hard Justice, where you got the swerve with Karen, uh, you know, screwing Joe. So, um, so they, so the security tries to get Karen out of the arena and <laughs> she was great, man. She's like, don't fucking touch me. Don't fuck. Like she, she really did have like a lot of heel in her. She's a great character. Very pretty as well. She was really, really good looking at this time, Karen. Uh, so you could definitely see Kurt's, you know, why Kurt was so attracted to her and obviously Jeff Jarrett as well. So, uh, but yeah, once you got Karen out of the way, it's just no nonsense. You got a clean finish. You got some, you know, straight up MMA style grappling. I, I thought it worked well. I really think it did. You know, True Slayer was not a big fan of, um, you know, the work shoot aspect of it with, with the MMA. Just thought it was kind of boring, a little bit slow. He was under the impression that they should have went in the direction of a company called U UWFI with the work shoot presentation. I never saw that company, so I, I don't understand exactly what he was referring to, uh, but he just thought that would have worked a lot better. I, I'm not sure exactly how they could have made it work to make it a little bit more engaging, but I, I, I still thought it worked. I, I think the problem... If he thought, and some people probably thought this as well, that Angle was saying that everyone was watching. They weren't chanting boring. They really weren't. I didn't hear any boring chants. And if they were, they weren't that noticeable. But um, during the grappling stuff and, you know, during the triangle chokes and a lot of the stuff that was a little bit slow, um... If the reaction wasn't great, 
I just think it had it had more to do with you know dropping the ball on Samoa Joe. I I, I really feel like at this point. This this is what kind of hurt Ring of Honor as well, uh, like around this time and, you know, years after it. Like, they just wait way too long to give the guy the championship while he's hot. I, I just think when you get to April of 2008, you, you're almost, you're really, really pushing it. And it, it's almost like Joe, Joe was at his hottest when he was X Division champion. And, and by this point, you know, you're almost like three years removed from the Samoa Joe heyday, from the Joe versus Kabashi heyday, or the unbreakable three-way heyday. It's just so much time has passed. And at the same time, like Joe, even though Joe trained good for this match and he looked great and everything, it, you know, his offense was well executed, you still didn't have the, the Joe in his prime here. He looked like he put on a little bit of weight. And I, I don't know. I, I don't really think it's the weight gain. I just think it's... It's just, uh, you know, you've seen it too many times. A anytime you, you, you deliver a, a pay-per-view match, you know, five times, there's definitely a burnout factor. So, um, but overall, I, I thought this crowd was great. And they did this whole thing where the, the loudest fans got a chance to meet some of the wrestlers. Um, you know, you know, I, you can make the argument that that might have helped out the crowd reaction, but no, the, the crowd reaction was not a problem on, on this show. I thought it was definitely a step up uh, from the impact zone. And I'll say this, man, I, I thought the MMA stuff was cool. I think angle angles, uh, grappling him going for, you know, Joe's ankle, some of the leg strikes, uh, the triangle chokes. I, I thought it was really, really well-timed. And whenever there was like, you know, some really, really nice suplexes or, you know, an angle slam or a belly to belly. Like they felt real, like they felt sudden and they felt important. And it just it just didn't feel like, all right, let's just um, let me just close on clothesline you five times in a row. You take five bumps and, you know, let me hit the ropes and, you know, then you bump again. It didn't feel like that. Anytime there was a, a belly to belly, it felt huge. And uh, I, you know, my favorite part of the match is when Angle tries to do a belly to belly to Joe. Joe hits him with a uh, Mongolian chop, and then he gives him a clothesline. And Angle sells it like he dies. Like he didn't, he doesn't bounce up from the clothesline; he just stays down. I thought that was sweet. It was, it was a little bit different. So um, yeah, the the submission work was great. You know, you saw you know some great transitions from the uh, muscle buster into the ankle lock you know there was you know there was some desperation on angle as well where he was he was stuck in an stf or a choke and he actually used the referee to get out of it and then mike Tanay and, and frank trigg got into an argument on commentary over that which i didn't think frank trigg was great on commentary i thought he was okay um but yeah man you got a clean finish you know joe going over with the muscle buster finish and I, I thought it was cool. I, I don't, you know, it's not my favorite Angle versus Joe match, but it's probably, um, it's not the worst either. I, I would rank them. This is how I rank them. You know, Turning Point 1, Genesis 2, Lockdown 3, uh, Final Resolution 4, and then Hard Justice uh, will be the fifth wheel uh, if we're just talking their their early TNA stuff. They, I've, you know, they actually had a, a rematch about 10 days later on Impact, which was pretty good, but, you know, uh, Steiner actually screwed Angle to set up the three-way, so you got a screw finish there. So that, that was another good match from them on Impact. They had, I think they might have had a WWE match, you know, before Angle officially hung it up for good. Uh, you know, they did some stuff later on in TNA, like around 2012, where the company tried to make a resurgence with the wrestling. But, you know, I, I, I like the Angle and Joe stuff. I, I don't think Joe and Angle was, was Angle's best. I don't think Joe was Angle's best opponent. But, you know, they drew money together and, you know, they, they gave you, um, you know, a match like this that was very successful in the buy rate. Great, very good in ticket sales. Really created a lot of buzz within a lot of the fans that like to watch more wrestling than just WWE. And I just felt like this match was different. It, it looked cool too. And and when, you know, um, Conrad and, and, you know, the Kurt Angle show, when they uploaded the, the thumbnail for this, you, you know, looking at Angle with these shorts on, with the MMA, you know, uh, inspired shorts, it, it just, it looks different. It, it, it gave you something uh, different. So I like that about it. Um, so so here's where some of the negative stuff comes in and and, and let, let me let me let me give you a quote from my brother uh you know I, I had a tough time um you know when i was at school uh you know selling tna to to some of my friends and even to my brother as well like uh, this one one of my friends man he was a huge kurt angle fan he just had no interest 
and watching anything other than WWE. So obviously I failed with him. And, and then my brother, I don't know, he just never really got into TNA. I don't know what it was. Um, I showed him the beginning of this match and he saw Kurt come out with the MMA shorts and, you know, not wearing any boots and he had his legs all taped up. And he just says to me, Kurt Angle's an idiot and he just walks out of the room and he didn't even want to watch the match. So that's kind of the effect I think this match had on some people. So, you know, you can make the argument like, why are you promoting the UFC? Why are you promoting MMA? You know, like, this is professional wrestling, you know. You know, the, the MM, you know, the UFC would never let, you know, people come in and pr promote uh, WWE or TNA. So why are we doing it here? Um, I could definitely understand the frustration. I could I could understand if some people would be frustrated by that. So um, but, you know, at the same time, I just think this is this is this was the direction the match needed to go in. Uh, when you look at Angle's amateur background, this is what he is. He's more of a, a real fighter. He's 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 a he's an amateur wrestler. He's an Olympic gold medalist. He's a grappler. Uh, the same thing with Samoa Joe. Joe is one of these guys that likes to incorporate, you know, uh, you know, jujitsu into his wrestling. You know, he he obviously trained. He trained in Las Vegas. He trained at the New Japan Dojo. Joe has a m very multi-dimensional move set. So I, that's why I think it kind of worked for this combination. But. Uh, at, at, at the same time, for the people that were a little bit disappointed when Kurt came out and said, he, you know, he doesn't regret, you know, going to WWE. But if he had the choice between WWE and UFC, if he, if he could take a time machine, he would have chosen uh, MMA. Um, I can understand if some people are disappointed by that. But hey, you know, that's that's one of the reasons why I would say Kurt is not the greatest of all time. That's why I will put guys like Benoit and, and Brett above him because, you know, their their foundation is professional wrestling. You know, Angle's foundation is, uh, you know, amateur wrestling. So it, it's a little bit different. You know, it, it's 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 totally different. Angle was trained from an early age not to watch pro wrestling. So there's going to be some side effects to that, you know, no matter how you look at it. But overall, I, I thought this is a cool match. I, I don't think it's quite the four and a half star rating that i think Meltzer and the torch gave it i think that's a little bit too high i'm, I'm more in the four star level true slayer actually gave this three and a half I, I thought he gave it two and a half i was wrong about that he actually gave it three and a half that's not a bad rating but you you could tell like he he just felt like a lot of the mma stuff uh didn't really click uh in certain aspects so i could definitely understand that but hey man this this was cool um I love the blood sports stuff. I love the incorporating uh, MMA and, you know, making it a uh, a worked shoot type of feel. And I thought they kind of did that here. I thought they I thought I thought it worked really, really well. I mean, is it the uh, over the top spot fest that uh, Angle versus Benoit in the steel cage was or Angle versus Mr. Anderson? No, not really. There's really not a lot of high spots here. It's pretty much ground and pound, you know, Angle. Uh, you know, he wasn't dressed to go to the top rope here. You know, I think if, if you were going to do a moonsault off the top of the cage, I think you would need boots for that. So Angle didn't have that going on here. But uh, but yeah, I, I still think it was it was a cool main event. I mean, is this going to be is Lockdown 2008 in contention for one of the top 20 TNA pay-per-views or one of the best lockdowns? You'd have to take. A lot of the stuff that went on here, you you can't take this card that seriously if you're going to put it in there. If you, if you want to argue that the double main event delivered and they delivered with the buy rate, so it should be looked upon as a tremendous success, I wouldn't disagree with that. I, I, I really wouldn't. Um, so, yeah, it's 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 a good lockdown. It, it's a good good main event, great main event. Um, but the, the card as a whole, uh, it's... It, it's somewhat lacking to me. It, 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 it really is. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm glad we went with Lockdown 2008. So the problem with Lockdown 2010 was it, it really, it, it caused a big divide. Uh, th that was around the time where I thought they had a lot of momentum with, you know, Nigel coming over. You know, Angle did some really, really good stuff with Nigel. You know, you, you kind of brought wrestling back with AJ, Daniels, and Joe. But I think at that point, you could just see the direction after bringing in Hogan and Bischoff was, was going to change. So b besides Angle and, and Anderson, 
you know, that was a great match. I, I, I love the match just as much as everybody else. But but the, the lockdown as a whole, I just remember it just not being that good. So that's why I passed up on lockdown 2010. But hey, if you want to make the argument to me that lockdown 2010 is worth checking out, and, and I'm not going to review it, but if you think it's, you think it's definitely in contention for being on that list, you want to make the argument, then, then go right ahead. But hey, man, you know, that's lockdown 2008. Hope everyone enjoyed the review, and I'm out. All right.